فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحوم كالطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روب الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Always in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى الحمد لله Always praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Always sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين Always upon the blessed family and all his companions and every one of us May Allah bless every one of us and our offspring to come right up to the end of time May Allah keep us all steadfast Amen. My brothers, my sisters, mashallah, we've had a very long day. And I think, subhanallah, you'd like me to close up early. Is that correct? Oh, mashallah. So I have a license to go on as I wish. Is that okay? Mashallah. I hope and I pray that we are rejuvenated, ready to listen to something very important. The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam speaks about as meaning fasting. And describes it as Jannah. Jannatun means a shield. So the fasting is a shield. A shield from what? A shield from all vice, all evil, all that which is distracting, all that which is disturbing, which is immoral, which is uh, displeasing to the Almighty. Everything it is a shield from that is negative. But Primarily a shield from hellfire. It will protect us from the burning hell. People don't like to listen to speeches connected to the burning hellfire or the punishment of the Almighty. But fortunately or unfortunately, it is important for us to address the matter of the wrath of Allah, the anger of Allah, the punishment of Allah. And you know what? The flames of the fire of hell. My brothers and sisters, it's a matter of belief. I came across people and I always come across people who say, do you believe that those who don't believe, do you believe that those who don't believe will go to heaven or will go to hell? And I say, the fact that they believe or don't believe is between them and their maker. And the maker himself has warned. So if they don't believe in the maker, what are they worried about? Why are they worried about what I believe and I don't believe? Because people are trying to say, as Muslims, you know what? How could you believe that someone who doesn't believe at all is not going to heaven? And I normally say, well, if you don't believe at all, then what are you worried about? Because the Christians believe that the non-Christians do not have a place in heaven. And the Jews believe that the non-Jews do not have a place in heaven. And so on. It's a matter of belief. We are Muslims, primarily we will develop our relationship with the Almighty who made us, and we will develop our relationship with the rest of the creatures of the same Almighty. That we've been saying all along. And when we prepare in that way, we know that there is a good place that we are going to. And we know that if we don't do good, how will we receive good as a, re as a result or in return? If you are to work hard during the year, you will pass your exams. If you are not to work hard and you are to play and you are to break rules, you might even be expelled from the school, right? Is that something bad? I mean, if one school expels you because you committed a crime in the school, does it mean the school is bad? Subhanallah, when you yourself perpetrated a crime, if your child were to do something really, really bad and you were to admonish them, does it make you a bad parent? Well, subhanallah, we need to strike this balance. We believe in the hereafter and we do believe in heaven and hell. And as for the owner of heaven and hell, he is Allah. He decides, he chooses and he will let into heaven whomsoever he wishes. He has already laid that bare in the Quran, in the sunnah, in revelation. And he's told us and he's warned us and we take heed. So when we want protection from this hellfire, we need to develop ourselves. Ya amanu taqullaha. So many times in the Quran, O oh you who believe, develop your relationship with Allah. O oh you who believe, be conscious of Allah. All this is included in the meaning of the term taqwallahi. Develop your relationship with Allah, be conscious of Allah, be fearful of earning the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be conscious of it. 
Every time be mindful of the fact that you have a maker. He made you, you're going to go back to him. This is taqwa Allah. Ya amanu taqullaha. We've heard it so much, right? Ya amanu kutiba alaykum siyamu. What does that mean? What does that mean? Oh, you who believe, please say it. Fasting has been prescribed upon you, right? So if you look at the two verses, one is, O oh, you who believe, be conscious of your maker or develop a relationship with your maker. And that's the translation we used for taqwa Allahi. I want to develop that taqwa, right? In order to develop that taqwa, here is another verse where Allah is saying, O oh, you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you. كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِن قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ just like it was prescribed upon those before you in order that you develop that relationship with Allah, in order for you to achieve the better relationship with Allah, or in order for you to develop taqwa, to attain the taqwa. That's what it means. So on one hand, Allah is saying, develop your taqwa. And on the other hand, He is saying, we've prescribed fasting upon you so that you can develop the taqwa. Can you marry the two? And you come to the conclusion that while I'm supposed to be developing my relationship with Allah, one of the ways that he says he has prescribed in order for that development to happen is for me to be fasting. You follow it? As simple as that. The same applies to prayer. If you are to pray, you will achieve taqwa. Prayer, I'm talking about the five daily prayers. And even beyond that, you can go to that which is voluntary and that which is totally up to you. It's called sunnah and nafil. And so my brothers and sisters, to develop this relationship with Allah is considered an honor. You should look forward to the month of Ramadan knowing that if I were to fast, believing in Allah, bearing that consciousness at the same time, believing that I'm going to be rewarded for what I'm doing, Allah says, you know what? You will achieve that paradise. You will achieve protection from hellfire. You will achieve the reward of becoming sinless as you depart from the month of Ramadan. So what should I do to become sinless? Do you know the hadith says, Man sama Ramadana, imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambihi. Whoever fasts the entire month properly, with conviction in Allah, expecting and hoping for a reward from Allah, all their previous sins are wiped out. Why? Because you're supposed to come out of Ramadan a changed person. You're supposed to be coming out of Ramadan having developed a beautiful, better relationship with your maker where you enjoy the acts of worship. Imagine you've been making long taraweeh every night and now the five salah only without the taraweeh should be a walk in the park compared to the taraweeh, right? Because you know what? I used to stand in prayer for two hours. Now it's just 10 minutes by five. It's made so easy. Allah is telling you this is the training ground. When you come out of training, you'll be a fit person ready to just lift up the weights. When you start going to the gym, the first few days are painful. They are difficult. You can't even bend. You can't even stretch. And when you're there for just a month, you become a professional. Right? I see a lot of you are nodding your heads. I hope you guys are sweating it out minimum 45 minutes a day. Wallahi, it helps you. It will enlighten you. It will improve your emotional condition, physical condition, spiritual condition, your health and everything else. 45 minutes of sweat every single day. You're going to do it? Ajib. Are you going to sweat 45 minutes every day? Some are saying, no, it's not in the Quran, it's not in the Hadith, mashallah. I didn't say I'm quoting Quran and Hadith regarding the sweating. This is my own piece of advice to you. From the Quran and Hadith, yes, it does say you need to be strong and fit and take care of your body. And remember, it's an, it's an amana entrusted to you by Allah. So you need to look after yourself. But I am telling you, it's a tip. It's a tip. When, when I say a tip, you know, in England, when you say this is a tip, it means it's like upside down, right? The room is a tip. I don't mean that tip. I mean, I'm giving you tips, okay? So basically, you are getting it from me to say if you want to improve your mental condition, your psychological condition, your health, your spiritual condition, your 
you know, you feel so much better. You need to do something, some exercise on a daily basis. You sweat it out and see how you feel. Trust me, all of you who are feeling sad and low and down. Yes, there is the dhikr of Allah, there is salah, there is ibadah. Together with that, just look after the amana that Allah has given you. This body through which you are able to worship Allah. Had you not looked after the body, you would not be able to worship Allah. Hence, the Prophet Muhammad says, Al-mu'minul qawiyyu khayrun wa ahabba ila Allahi min al-mu'min al-da'if. A strong believer is better and more loved by Allah than one who is weak. When you walk, walk with a good posture. Don't just, you know, hunch and like, yeah, by the way, I'm a mu'min, you know, I believe in Allah. <laughs> That's not what it is. You walk, take pride in the way you walk. It's an honor. MashaAllah, Allah gave you the body, the posture. Your back must be straight. Don't just slouch on your phone every evening and then you're wondering why your back is aching and why your spine is out of order. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us all and grant us good health. Say, Amin. My brothers, my sisters, the gift of fasting is such that if we are to observe it correctly, it will improve our relationship with Allah. At the end of Ramadan, we come out and we enjoy the, 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 the worship that we have been engaging in now in a smaller way. Ramadan is the month of worshipping Allah because things are for sale. Sale meaning the value of the items shoots up such that the, the currency that you are paying for the, for the commodity you are receiving is actually a bargain for you. You do one good deed and it's multiplied, right? You do something and it's multiplied. The reward is multiplied 10 times, 70 times, 700 times. The charities are multiplied. It's up to Allah what He does and how much He gives you. The fasting itself is so, so important that Allah says, every good deed you do, I multiply it for you 10 times, 70 times, 700 times, except the fast. The fasting is mine and I will reward it according to the person. Done. Which means it could go to 7 million depending on the sacrifice you were ready to make. However, when we fast, we fast holistically in order to make it the real shield that we are looking for from the fire of Jahannam. What is a holistic fast? Just like you are concerned about what goes into your mouth, making sure nothing's supposed to go in that would displease Allah, that would break your fast, you make sure nothing comes out of your mouth that is going to be harmful, abusive, wrong, spoil your fast, destroy your relationship with Allah and hurt people. If you're not going to watch your mouth in Ramadan, you're wasting your time having fasted. Did you hear that? If you're not going to watch your mouth in the month of Ramadan, you've wasted your time fasting. I'm not saying that. The hadith is saying it. The Prophet ﷺ says, مَن لَمْ يَدْعَ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ وَالْجَهْلَ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَةٌ فِي أَنْ يَدْعَ أَطْعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَهُ A person who is going to who is not going to ensure that they abstain from bad mouthing, from bad words, from false witness, from that which will displease Allah in terms of what they utter from their mouth. If they are going to abstain from food and drink in that condition, they are wasting their time. Allah doesn't need the fact that they stayed away from food and drink. They wasted their time. You see, like the Prophet ﷺ says, there are so many people who fast during the day. They've achieved nothing besides hunger and fatigue. Or hunger and thirst. And there are so many people who stand at night in prayer, but they achieve nothing besides loss of sleep and fatigue. That's it. Why? Because your intention is wrong. You're not allowing it to improve you as an individual, as a person. You see? So, if you want to be saved from Jahannam, make sure that you don't abuse people, you don't oppress people. I want to tell you, it is more important to ensure that you have not harmed a fellow human being than most other sins that you could commit. Do you know why? If you committed adultery, terrible sin, major sin, but you seek forgiveness from Allah, He'll wipe it out. You, if, you, if you engaged in perhaps partaking of intoxicants that's not allowed in Islam, and you know what? You then sought the forgiveness of Allah, He will wipe it out. Do you know why? It's between you and Him. But the minute you slandered someone, there are now three people involved, meaning three parties involved. Who? You and Allah, and there is another guy. Or another person. Allah is Ghafoor, Rahim, most merciful, most forgiving. That person is not most forgiving, most merciful. By right, if you want to be forgiven for something you did wrong against someone else, you are going to have to put your tail between your legs and go to them and say, you know what? Meaning put your ego away, your pride needs to go aside. Say, listen, my brother, I'm really sorry for what I said about you. I was totally wrong, totally unjustified, and that's it. Please forgive me. 
He might say yes, he might say no, you tried. It's your right to say yes and no. If someone's been harming you for 10 years and they come to you say, brother, I really, I'm sorry, you know what, I did wrong, forgive me. It's up to you. You can say, okay, forgive you. Allah encourages you to forgive. Allah tells you and I, just forgive the people. Just forgive them. You know what? Let it go. Release it. Allah will release you from the clutches of hellfire. Learn to forgive. Learn to embrace. And you know what? Forgiveness, mostly we are taught to forgive. But we are never taught to forget. People say forgive and forget. No. In Islam, the forget part of it is not necessary. If you've forgiven from your heart, one of two things. You can either embrace, that's the best type of forgiveness, which means we're buddies again, or you can forgive without an embrace. Which means I've forgiven you, but I don't really want to have much to do with you because I really don't know if I'm going to be harmed again from you. Whoa. Sometimes it happens. We have toxic relationships in the home. Some, not in the home, but around relatives. I hope not in the home, subhanAllah. Or around people who really harm, we've released it from the heart. It's ejected. I don't want to hold it. Personally, I'm talking of myself. I don't have space in my heart to rent, for someone's hatred to rent a spot in. Not at all. I don't want it. It's not there. I will not hold it. It's gone. It's forgiven. It's over. But, but, perhaps I may not want to have much to do with you. Why? I need to protect myself. Every time I pass this path, I get a slap. Every time I pass this path, I get a slap. Why should I keep passing it? I might have forgiven you, but I will walk from that angle. Is there anything wrong? I don't have to keep on coming and embracing you and getting a slap every time I say, forgive. People think a pious Muslim is a person who just keeps getting slaps. That's not a pious Muslim. Sometimes a pious Muslim is he who says, hey, hey what are you doing? Be careful. You know, I'll slap you back. You're not going to carry on this way. I'm sure you've heard of the guy, I've said the story so many times, the guy who tried his luck by slapping some of the pious people in the mosque. He was told these are three people sitting in the front, very pious. That one is little pious, medium pious, big pious. So he went to little pious and he, he, that guy was busy in his ibadah, gave him one slap. The man didn't even notice. He says, ooh, pious, first time I'm seeing piety. And the young man comes about, subhanAllah. He comes about, he goes to the middleman, he says, you know what, this guy is supposed to be more pious than that one. And the piety of the man behind me is non-existent. <laughs> Got it there. So, subhanallah, that's okay, we let him go this time. I'm the small pious, I didn't even notice, did you see? So my brothers and sisters, the middle pious, guess what happened? He got a slap and... He got up and he says, brother, how's your hand? Are you sure you're okay? Ooh, this guy is very, very pious. He's got a slap, subhanallah. The man's got a slap. And he gets up and he's worried about the hand that has slapped him. Ooh, isn't that a high level? Come on, guys. Is that not a high level? It's a high level, right? And he was wondering. He says, oh, no, my hand is fine. Okay, that guy sat down. He went to the last guy whom he was told this is the most pious of the lot. And guess what happened? He gave him one slap. The very pious man got up and gave him two slaps. And the guy says, but I thought you were the most pious of the lot. He says, well, someone somehow somewhere needs to stop you, right? You can't keep on going to slap people you consider pious, okay? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. The moral of that story was, sometimes it's better to think before you react. Sometimes it's good to perhaps keep quiet about things. Sometimes you might want to address matters in a different way. Sometimes you might have to get up and say, hey guys, you better stop this or we're going to deal with you. Okay? So my brothers and sisters, when it comes to Allah, He will forgive you. When it comes to Allah, He will always forgive you. I want to clarify something today. Never ever will Allah reject your tawbah, your repentance. It will always be accepted. The first time that you ask Allah, Oh Allah, forgive me. You are genuine. You've regretted your sin. You're admitting there is remorse. You're asking Allah's forgiveness and you're promising Him deep down that you're, gonna, you're not going to repeat this. Allah says, forgiven. Now shaitan comes to you. My sisters, I hope you're listening. My brothers, I hope you're listening. Now that you've asked Allah's forgiveness because of the sins you've committed, no matter what they were, and they have been wiped out completely just by the first time you ever asked Allah. That's all. You ask Allah one time. Look at Adam alayhi salam. 
when he committed the sin, him and his wife, Hawa, our mother, our father, when they ate from the tree they were not supposed to eat from. And you know what? They just told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Oh our Lord, oh our Lord, we have oppressed ourselves, we have wronged ourselves. We have wronged ourselves. And if you don't forgive us, then if you don't have mercy on us and forgive us, we are going to be the losers. Allah says, I've forgiven you. How many times did he repeat that? Subhanallah. He said it once. He sought the forgiveness of Allah. Allah forgave him. He may have said it another time somewhere down the line, but that was already after the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when you seek forgiveness, Allah forgives you without a doubt. For as long as you admit regret, you ask Him for the forgiveness and you promise not to do it again. Those are the four simple conditions, okay? Now shaitan comes to you and tries to tell you, no, 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 you weren't forgiven. You've got to say it again. So now a week later, two days later, you're repeating it. My brothers and sisters, it's healthy to repeat repentance because it elevates your status and makes you conscious of your weakness and the power of Allah. So it's healthy to repeat it, but you're not repeating it because you're doubting Allah's mercy. Let's get that straight. You're repeating it because you love Allah and you just are so sad about what you did. But don't let shaitan creep in and Try and make you feel that no, Allah rejected you. So Allah's mercy doesn't encompass the particular sin you committed. The minute you begin to think that, you have already fallen back into the trap of the devil. Because Allah tells you, Oh my worshippers who have transgressed against me, never ever lose hope. In my mercy, I will forgive all of your sins. I am indeed the most forgiving and the most merciful. That's what Allah says. So when Allah is saying, my mercy encompasses everything. And the devil is telling you, no, it encompasses everything except the sin you committed. Then you're falling for the devil and you haven't understood who your maker is. You haven't understood how the most merciful is and who he is and the power of his and the mercy that he has informed us about. When Allah wanted to call himself, he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most forgiving, the most merciful. He could have chosen anything else. Whenever we describe Allah, He's always talking about His mercy. Ramadan, what is it called? It's called the month of mercy, isn't it? The month of mercy, right? It's called the month of mercy, the month of the Quran, the month of forgiveness, the month of the, you know, the, the, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the month of freedom from hellfire. That's what we're talking about. So you never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. But the problem is, when you've wronged someone else, that person is not merciful as Allah. Subhanallah. This is why we say, watch your mouth. It's more dangerous. You're going to pay for that more than anything else. Because the hadith speaks about a bankrupt person. The companions were asked, do you know who is a bankrupt person? So they said, well, a bankrupt person, according to us, is the one who has no... Dirham and dinar, right? In our language, we say pounds and dollars, right? Soon it might be Bitcoin, by the way. <laughs> Again, okay? So it could be, whatever it is, the currency. That's what we look at, materialism. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were told, no, 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 no. A bankrupt person is the one who comes on the day of Qiyamah with lots of fasting, with lots of prayer with lots of good deeds with lots of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when he arrives with all these lovely beautiful powerful deeds he has harmed this one he ate the wealth of this one he has sworn this one abused that one he has uh, you know deceived this one and done this to that one etc etc so what will happen as he came with his deeds those people whom he owes the currency to and not day on that day the currency is deeds you give your deeds away so some deeds will go here, some deeds will go there, some deeds will go to that one, some deeds will go to this one, until the pile begins to diminish. And when the pile is totally over, and there's still a queue of people asking for their rights, because why? You didn't control your mouth. You didn't manage your character and conduct. So what happened? You lost out. Your good deeds all went away. No more good deeds to pay. You start taking the bad deeds of the other people. Why? As a payment for the bad deed you did. I did one bad to you. I got no way to recompense. Allah says, okay, take one of his bads and put them on you. May Allah not do that to us. 
So what will happen? The person ends up going into hellfire because they wronged fellow human beings. That's why we say, you want to go to heaven? Two big qualities you're going to need. Develop your relationship with Allah and watch out how you treat the rest of the creatures of the same Allah. How He created you, He created them. What makes you a big deal? Subhanallah. Today on the globe, we're lacking character and conduct. People don't, I mean, people don't greet. They don't smile. They don't look. They don't even acknowledge. We walk past Muslimin, subhanallah. Even if they're not Muslim, at least we're supposed to have a good expression on our faces. But it's like all doom and gloom. We're walking like subhanallah, you know. It reminds me of the little acorn, the story of the acorn. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Become conscious of your character. And it begins at home. It starts at home. When Allah created you, He chose for you the parents that were meant to be your own. And those who delivered you, your mothers, were chosen by Allah, not by you. As a test. No matter how good or bad your parents are, they will remain your parents. Even if they're transgressing with the biggest transgressions, they are still your biological parents. You have a right to fulfill unto them. My brothers and sisters, watch how you address your parents. Watch how you speak to your mothers and fathers. And my beloved mothers and fathers, watch how you treat your children. I want to pause and say something very strong. You know, children actually belong to Allah, not to us. Ask those who don't have. Who do they cry to for children? Allah. Why? Oh, Allah bless me. Because Allah has. If Allah wants, He will give you. Allah says, some we don't give any children to because we know it's better for them. They don't know. We know. So we don't give it to them. Be happy. Some we only give boys because we know we won't give girls to them. It's better for them only to have boys. Some we give them only girl, only girls because we know that they shouldn't be having boys for whatever reason. Allah knows. Some we give both. Some we delay. Some we give very quickly. Allah knows what's best for you. But everyone complains. Who is there to thank Allah? The one who has boys say, Oh Allah, you only gave me boys. The one who has girls, oh Allah, you only gave me girls. The one who doesn't have, oh Allah, you haven't given me anything. The one who has both, oh Allah, this is such a handful, etc. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So Allah knows what He's given you. Thank Him. But I want to tell you, the children belong to Allah. Allah gave them to you temporarily and He's going to take them away. He will take them away. He may take you away before them. Or he will take them away before you. It is totally up to him. You have to be happy with the decree of Allah. We get so attached to our children that we don't even want them to get married. I know of people who are so attached to their sisters or brothers that they don't even want to agree for them to marry someone because they are too scared and they don't even want to let go. And when the person is married, they don't release them totally and give them their independence. Yet we were independent at the age of 23. This young lady is 30 and you haven't given her a little bit of her own mind and letting her make her decisions. It's a sickness. It's a weakness. What you have to do? Allah gave you the children in order to test you. Are you going to do what we want you to do? Or are you going to do what you want to do against what we want to do? For example, your child wants to marry. Ask yourself a question. This is why I bring it up. We get it every single day without fail. For the last 10 years, every single day, we get marital issues on a daily basis. Child wants to marry. The parents need to ask themselves, Obviously, if both the boy and the girl would like it to happen, does Allah allow it? If the answer is yes, tell yourself, who am I to disallow what Allah has allowed? Thank you. Did you hear that? But no, we say, no, the brother's too black, you know. I promise you, I've heard that. Black. Bilal ibn Rabah was from Jannah. He was the darkest of the lot. And the Prophet ﷺ came back and said, Oh Bilal, I went up to Mi'raj. And guess what? I heard your footsteps there. He didn't look at the fairest of the lot and say, Hang on, who's more, who's fair in complexion? Yeah, yours. Your footsteps in Jannah. No way. It had nothing to do with color. You slice here, you slice there, you slice anywhere. The blood is red, my brothers and sisters. Racism has no space in Islam, not at all. If you do not respect a person simply because their complexion is less than yours, I promise you, you are doomed. You are doomed. My brothers and sisters, you want paradise. Understand, people are equal. 
That's what Allah says. The day you get to Allah and He gives you your book of records in your right hand, you can then say, I did well. For now, no one knows where they're going. Who knows? Subhanallah. I promise you the reason why I'm passionate about this. I travel through Africa and I witness some of the best Muslims I've seen in my life happen to be in the darkest corners of Africa. And I tell myself, if only those who are fair in complexion knew, subhanallah, they would think, perhaps Jannah is going to be full before we get there. But the good news is Jannah is so broad, inshallah, it'll cater for every one of us. Amen. My brothers and sisters, treating fellow human beings with respect, your own children, ask, telling yourself, if Allah has allowed something, who am I to disallow it? That is a question that would result in your entry into paradise. Yes, if there's something wrong, if there are drugs involved, bad habits involved, etc., then you can address the matter and say, look, the reason why I'm not too happy with this is because here we have someone whose reputation is not grand at all. And wait to clarify it. I verify it. Find out more about it. Be a little bit more concerned about these things. Don't just say no. You know, I can't. Because what's my family going to say? Every day we're teaching people this. What's my family going to say? Forget about your family. What's Allah going to say? Allah will take the child away before you, man. And you didn't even fulfill the right of the child. I know of families who've kept their daughters unmarried intentionally because the girl has a good salary that's going straight to the father. And the father is so scared that perhaps that salary might be lost and we're going to lose money. Just keep her alone and single. And you punish your own child because you're worried about money being lost. A'udhu billah. Where do you want to go? Heaven or elsewhere? Don't pretend like you don't know what elsewhere means. Yes. How could you do that? How on earth can you treat your child like she is, she or he is just your ownership and that's it. It's the ownership of Allah. When someone passes away, what do we say? Inna lillahi. We all belong to Allah. Wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We're all going to go back to Allah. That's what we say. Why do you lie? To you, we all belong to Allah. No, but my children belong to me. Come on. Treat your children with respect. We're living in an age where the globe has become a little village. Forget about where you come from ethnically, far back in the day, wherever you were. If the children were born, raised, they went to the same schools, they went to the same universities, they are of a similar upbringing, no matter what their color or background or original nationality might have been. They are of a similar upbringing. People say, no, they're not, uh, you know, Pakistani enough. Sorry to give that example, but it's happening. It's happening. And not just Pakistani, but any other. It's not fair. Do you really think you're going to come on the day of Qiyamah and when Allah asks you, why didn't you let this happen? You're going to say, they weren't Pakistani. <laughs> yes. Some people, are, I'm actually pressing a red button. You might not like me for it, but we're doing this. And your child is busy committing zina on a daily basis. Because why? You're just blocking it. That's it. I'm not trying to justify their sin. But I'm saying you do have a role to play. And you do carry a share of the burden. Without a doubt. Every time you make halal easy, you've protected people from haram. And every time you've made halal difficult, you've encouraged people to engage in haram and facilitated it for them. Remember this. What type of paradise do you want? What's Ramadan going to help you? Zero. Nothing. You won't get any help, no benefit, because your heart is dirty. You are too proud. Your ego has obstructed the acceptance of your fast. You might have fulfilled the farad, but you did not achieve the broader benefit of the month of Ramadan. You needed to have cleaned your heart. That's all. Consider yourself one weak slave of Allah, just like everyone else. Perhaps they are stronger than you. Where is this arrogance and pride? It's from shaitan. That's why the hadith says, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال حبة من خردل من كبر He will never enter paradise in whose heart is a mustard seed's weight worth of pride. Your ego, your arrogance. How much of it? Mustard seed's weight worth of pride. What does the hadith say? No paradise. Ouch. 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 
I have a lot of work to do. I have to work on myself more than what I am. And I think the same applies to every single one of us. Without a single exception, we can do better. We can. I want you to pause for a moment. And I want to show you how bad the issue is. Think to yourself, weren't you trained to think from childhood that you know what? Those people are not as good as us. Whether it's another tribe, whether it's people from another city, whether it's people from the north of your own city, whether it's people from the other side of the river, whether it's people from another continent or another race. Weren't you taught to feel, whether it was direct or indirect is another thing, weren't you taught to feel that you know what? Those guys, not good. Those people, watch out for them. They're very wild. Those people, they deceive a lot. So who's the good ones? Just us. That's it. Just us. We're the good ones. How could you ever think of getting married to those people? You know, they're from the other side of the river. No wonder why our rivers are, our rivers are drying up. Subhanallah. May Allah forgive us. My brothers, my sisters, chop it. Cut it out. Become a mu'min. Believe in Allah. Surrender to Allah. Allah warns you and tells you that don't do this, but we're doing it. And you know who's doing it? Those who make six salah, they are doing this. They, they don't only read the five. They get up for tahajjud. But they are as racist as you can find. I promise you, it's a disease in the ummah. If we don't address it, what's the point of going into Ramadan, feeding the world, doing everything? But there is a little war going on in your own home where your children don't even want to see your face because you're a tyrant. I always say, forget about the Pharaoh. You're a little Pharaoh in your own house. I hope there's a Moses to stand up to you. My brothers and sisters, we enter the month of Ramadan, we want to be safeguarded, safeguard others, those under your authority. Yes, I'm not trying to say that you need to forget about the method of getting married in your own culture, but where it clashes with Islam, Islam comes first, because Islam is broad. Many people give a bad picture, an image, and name to Islam simply because they've allowed the dirty culture to overtake sometimes. And not all cultures are dirty, and not all sections of the cultures are dirty. But, subhanallah, I remember a sister coming to me and saying, you know, I really want to get married. And my father's doing nothing about it. And my brothers are doing nothing about it. And I said, sister, they, at least they should try to introduce you to someone. That's called an arranged introduction, not an arranged marriage. In Islam, you cannot just arrange a marriage where you say, right, uh, you know what, July the 20th, that's your, uh, that's your marriage, that's your wedding. Hey, wow, my wedding, to who? Oh, you'll find out on the 19th. Okay? <laughs> that's not allowed in Islam, not at all. That is not Islam, that's prohibited actually, no way. But you're allowed to arrange an introduction. That's what we may do. And that's what we can do and should do actually. Arrange an introduction. So I've introduced you and you may agree or not agree within a short space of time. You may want to meet a second and a third time. Obviously a proper meeting in the right way. Second, third, fourth, fifth time. The minute you know that this is not where I'm supposed to be going, it's a no. Respectfully turn it down and carry on. You may be introduced a second, a third time. Do you know, three days ago, I received an email. And this is not the first time I've received it. Educated women in our societies are complaining that they are treated like a product, commodity. They're made to do the samosa run. You know what's a samosa run? I explained it a few days ago in one of my talks. The guy comes home, he's sitting in the lounge with his parents and so on. And a little while later, this woman, highly educated, whoever, she's supposed to walk in with a tray, and the tray is supposed to have on it some, some, maybe some samosas or whatever. And you know what? She's supposed to walk through, come, put it down, salam alaikum, and walk out. Right? Do you like her or you don't like her? <laughs> uh, you know, and he starts blushing. And they say we feel so bad because one guy says no, the next guy says no. I mean, what am I? Am I just like, like a motor vehicle? People come in, they check, they see, I ah, know not this car. Okay, right, let's go. That's not, that's so insulting to your kids. May Allah protect us. May Allah forgive us. No wonder why some of those samosas have so much chili in them. 
They really want to give the message to you and to everyone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. My brothers and sisters, the deen of Islam is purer than that. It is better than that. It is higher than that. It gives us much more respect than that. I told you to arrange an introduction is, is yes, it's a sunnah. It is. You arrange the introduction, no problem. But it is also a sunnah to go out and request. You are allowed to tell your dad as a woman, Oh my father, I want to marry a certain man. Can you please find out more about him? There is nothing wrong with that in Islam. But today we say, what? You can never do that. How could you? Where did you meet him? Where did you see him? Gosh, dad, you busy watching porn every day and you worried about me. It's a reality. It's a fact. The children are suffering because of the hypocrisy of the parents. And you want Ramadan to come through and you want to be a big person. I'm fasting all day. You know, 18 hour fast, make dua for me. Brother, you need a bigger dua about your treatment of your children. Wallahi. We're tired of this. How long is this going to continue? And how long are we going to keep telling the pious to stop it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all. Facilitate good things. Allah will facilitate your Jannah for you. Imagine you got your child married to someone they really wanted to marry. Dua comes out of their heart for you. And after you've passed away, you see the fruit of it, the result of it. The problem with us, we lack communication in the home. So the child doesn't talk to you. They're quiet because they're too scared. If I tell my dad what goes on at the uni, then you know what? I'm going to be in big trouble. My dad won't even send me there anymore. There's no communication. But you need communication. You need to guide your children. You need to know what's going on around the globe. You need to know what's happening in your environment. What's happening with the children today. The environment out there is not easy anymore. People of all faiths are worried about their children. Because why? There are drugs. There are people out there ready to abuse these children. So develop this communication with them. Keep them close to you. When they say something, don't react in a way that tomorrow they won't repeat anything again to you. But react in a nice way. Be calm. Be cool about it. And Allah will open your doors. My brothers and sisters, do you want to be saved from hellfire? Do you want the fast to really be a shield for you? Well, in that case, you need to know what the holistic fast is all about. It's not only about abstaining from food and drink and about reading taraweeh at night and about feeding the poor only. It is about you and your entire attitude. Your whole approach to life needs to improve. You need to make sure you are a thorough Muslim who puts your maker before yourself. If your maker has let things happen, alhamdulillah. I promise you, I, I really rate the men who stand up for their daughters. I really rate the men who stand up for their daughters. When there is something, you say, no, she wants this, let it be. If Allah didn't disallow it, it will happen. Because people are going out to universities and colleges and to work every day. They interact with some lovely people sometimes. Better than anyone you can ever bring from back wherever you're going to bring them from. Yes. I'm not saying anyone is bad or good because we cannot judge, but I'm saying the general trend is that people are doing it wrong. You need to stand up for your own kids. You need to support them in their thinking. Many of us here, and perhaps the previous generation, when we were 20, 25, we made all the decisions on our own. But with our children, no, we enslave them up to the age of 30, 35, 40, sometimes even beyond that. It's just me who's controlling the whole life. Even the way he manages his own wife, I'm in charge. Why? I'm the father. That's wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. May Allah forgive us. You know, I want to weep when I see the problems of the age. And the reality is Islam is looked at with the eye of skepticism as it is already. And when people come in, people revert to Islam. Do you know what we offer them? We say people, meaning we say that people have entered Islam, they, they utter the shahada, they come in, Ashhadu, Ashhadu, Allah, ilaha illallah, wa Ashhadu, anna Muhammad rasulullah Once they're done, what do we offer them? Don't we say takbir, right? Don't we say takbir, am I right? We're right. And after that, over. Done. That was my, my right. I fulfilled my duty. I did takbir. 
The person who just entered the fold of Islam is the purest from all of us seated here completely. And at that stage, we are not even prepared to entertain them if they were to come to marry our children. We say no. Subhanallah. I've had people say, how could I allow my daughter to marry this man? He's a revert. Abu Bakr was a revert. Umar was a revert. Uthman was a revert. Ali was a revert. They were all reverts. If you existed at that time, you would have probably rejected them all. A'udhu Billah. They were reverts. Open your hearts, open your minds, then you benefit from the month of Ramadan. No point in looking at revert brothers and sisters and thinking to yourself, Oh, I'll feed them, I'll clothe them, I'll be happy, I'll say, Mashallah, I'll go and tell people, Today we had two shahadas. What two shahadas? Hypocrite. Allah forgive us. They were to come to you. And I'm not saying impose, no. If both parties, your child and that particular revert, male or female, wanted this to happen, ask yourself the same question. Would Allah, does Allah allow this? If Allah allows it, who am I to disallow it? Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam. Muhammad wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.